Hello, and welcome to History 1102 with Professor James Cement. This is the lecture for week four. This is lecture three, continuing and finishing up our discussion of the Enlightenment. Thus far in examining the Enlightenment, we've provided a definition of the Enlightenment. The idea that through, the, through rational thinking, through logic, through observation of human nature, we could come to better understand human nature and then to create institutions to build upon that understanding of, of human nature, to build institutions to create a better society in which human beings can live. We also looked at the basic principles of the Enlightenment. Liberty, rational thought, the challenging of existing ideas, ex the exploration of human nature, the improvement of society, tolerance of others and people with different ideas, equality, the consent of the governed, and ultimately, when it applies to women, the treating of women as rational creatures, so that the equality uh, of all human beings under, within the Enlightenment understanding applies to both genders. We looked at some of the ideas that led up to the Enlightenment, including the scientific revolution. We looked at the, the uh, role of the Protestant Reformation. We looked at the idea of Renaissance humanism. We looked at the uh, Europe's expansion into the world, the encountering other cultures and other societies that made uh, many uh, European thinkers begin to question uh, the principles of their own society and think that there may be other ways of thinking about how the world works and, the na and how, what human nature is all about. We exampled the political uh, antecedents to the Enlightenment, the terrible religious wars of the 16th century, 17th century, the, the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648, that led many people to question um, where, your, where society was and to question religious principles uh, in terms of the uh, fighting that had gone on during the Thirty Years. People coming to think that humans must rise above religious differences in order to avoid this kind of carnage and this kind of destruction. Then we took a look at sort of the early uh, French Enlightenment thinkers like Descartes and Pierre Bayle, who exam who tried to come up with the idea of first principles, uh, basic ideas, basic principles about human nature that, and, and how human beings relate to, to, to their society, how they relate to the natural world, and to try to, from those first principles, and from these larger principles, try to deduce the, the, the basic uh, uh, subcomponents, the basic components of human nature, uh, f famously as Rene Descartes declared, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. The idea there was that, was that the mind preceded everything else. The thinking preceded everything else. Therefore, if one could control and, 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 and develop one's rational thinking, from that one could build a better society. But there was another, but there was another enlightenment, a sort of school of enlightenment thought. If the French school of Enlightenment thought, as you know, characterized by René Descartes, Descartes, was sort of deductive in its approach, that is, coming up with general first principles about human nature, about the way the mind works, and then working down from there to understand smaller truths and to develop better society from these first principles, such as the mind comes before uh, the world, uh, the larger world, then we can look at another school of thought, which was what we might call the English school of philosophical thought, English and Scottish school of uh, philosophical thought, um, in which inductive reasoning, in other words, not starting with first principles, but starting with very close observation of human nature, of the details of human nature, and then building up from there to come up with first principles. So sort of a, the inverse of the French approach. And these two sort of schools of philosophical thought out of the Enlightenment continue on to this very day. And of course, we have to be careful in the sense that, you know, we, we call it the English school of philosophical Enlightenment thought, but, you know, many French thinkers took it up as well as many English thinkers uh, took up the ideas uh, produced by French Enlightenment thinkers. And of course the origins of the sort of English philosophical school of the Enlightenment of sort of building up from smaller things, building up from observations and, and, and evidence of, of the senses, of course goes back to uh, Francis Bacon, uh, the great uh, sort of the early thinker of the scientific revolution 
who argue that nothing that we begin with nothing but a rational outlook that we build from evidence and experimentation um, and this sort of leads to the idea of inductive reasoning starting with observation and evidence starting with the little ideas and coming to grander conclusions based on those this idea of inductive reasoning is crucial to the growth of science of course in a sense, natural philosophers, or scientists we call them now, had to make two separations to build modern science. First, from ancient knowledge, all those ancient Greek ideas uh, developed by Aristotle and others, and from theology. Um, and then they had to sort of break free from uh, what we might call the metaphysics of first principles. In other words, that idea that there are these general f principles uh, from which all uh, nature can be understood rather than sort of beginning at the bottom looking at actual observations of things going on in the real world um, and then building uh, uh, larger theories out of those sort of the, the uh, Isaac Newton's approach you know he sort of studied physical uh, actual physical phenomena and then built his larger laws of physics based on those uh, basic uh, observations he had made of simple physical properties of matter and energy. So in terms of the scientific revolution, this idea of what we might call the metaphysics of things, how do we understand things um, as opposed to the knowledge itself, but how do we come to understand this? Science basically moved beyond that. So, uh, natural philosophers moved beyond that because they came to the conclusion that you have to look at the real world, you have to look at the evidence, you have to look at the smaller phenomena to create the greater principles. But in philosophy, um, the metaphysics uh, remain very important because it was all about human nature and they had to sort of come to the idea of how does the human mind actually work? So does it does it have these first principles built into it? Certain principles that it that are that are in nature, in in the very nature of who we are. And once we understand those, we can then understand how we think. And if we can understand how we think, then we can understand how we can better think. And then if we understand how we better think, we can build a better society from that. But so that idea, that that exploration of metaphysics that's at the heart of the Enlightenment. In other words, how do we come to understand things uh, remains central to uh, the philosophy of the Enlightenment. And we see it sort of diverge, as I said before, into these two schools, a sort of French school that looked at it from the top down, starting with first principles, uh, and then uh, try to understand uh, human nature based on those first principles, or do we start at the bottom looking at actual observation of how human minds work and it, or does human minds build from observation of nature ex experiencing the actual world as it is and then building out larger ideas out of it. the first important thinker in the English school was a man named John Locke who lived from 1632 to 1704 and Locke began in a very different place than Descartes had begun Whereas Descartes had begun again with these gigantic first principles that controlled how the mind worked and that were built into the mind. What Locke argued was that basically we learn from the senses, we learn from our experience, we learn from little things, and once we gather enough of this information and enough of this experience and enough of this sensual, sen sensory input, we then come up with larger ideas about how the world works. Um, and in um, he he told people to look at look at children and look at their behavior in an, uh, their be in an observational way. Um, so in, the, in a sense, he is trying to understand how the mind works from looking at something in the natural world. That is children's behavior. What what Locke says, for example, is we have these concepts in our head. For example, the examples he gives is say the concept of color, like the concept of whiteness, or the concept of say just uh, something that you can actually see and experience and he uses the example of an elephant um, now De De Descartes and his deductive school that is thinking from first principles would say that we have these ideas in our head innately from God color animalness bigness from which we under come to understand what an elephant is what does Locke say Locke says just the opposite we don't have these first principles in our head, this category of bigness, or this category of animalness, or this category of color. What we have in our head, what we, we start out with in life, is a blank slate. We are 
completely empty in our hands when we are born. Um, we are born simply, the only thing we are born with is the capacities to understand and to reason. We then observe through our senses, reflect upon, using our mind, reflect upon the things that we are observing and we are sensing, and we come to an understanding of what an elephant is or what the color white is in that way. Now this seems obvious to us, but it is because of Bach, Locke's idea of building this model, this idea that we begin with this sort of blank slate and we take in these observations, we use our senses, uh, we take in sensory input, and we, cu and we use our, the innate rationality that we have, the innate ability to understand things, and then we build models from that. That's how we understand reality. So from Locke, one can understand the idea that we think of, that what we think of as God-given, the natural order of government, uh, the chain of being, that certain people are, are higher on the chain of being than others, that there's a chain of being from, from starting with God, through the angels, through human beings, through animals, through plants, through inanimate objects, this, this medieval concept, that, it is, that everything that we think, basically, uh, doesn't even matter the details, that all of what we think um, is incurred through sensation, experiencing the world, sensing it, and then um, coming to understand it through our, you know, taking all that that's coming in and building models that we, with our brains, with, with our minds. Um, but what the implication of this is, and this is the most important part, is if we are just products of our sensation and our experiences and then we use our rational understanding to make sense of them then it is possible that the construct that we have of the world and how the world works uh, based on these experience and senses that we, since we start out as a blank slate and simply have our rational understanding and then we take in all these experiences and all of this sort of input that we get um, as we you know go through life then obviously we can change those constructs that nothing that we have come to believe is absolutely determined beforehand everything is changeable everything is based on our understanding of things and through our through all the senses and all the other observations that we've made that we're capable of coming up with all kinds of different constructs all kinds of different ways of thinking how the world works and how nature human nature works and how society works and also the potential to change it to make it different to make it better now, all of this thinking about human nature was uh, published in an essay uh, that uh, Locke wrote called Essay on Human Understanding. The essay, concerning, the essay concerning human understanding was written in 1689. Now, Locke was a, was, a, was a broad thinker. He was not only thinking about human nature, but he was also a political philosopher, trying to understand how we order society and, of course, how we can make society better, to better serve the people who live within it. So he was also, as I said, he was also a political philosopher. And around the same time that he, that he um, wrote essay on concerning human understanding, he also um, published an essay called Two Treatises of, Two Treatises of Civil Government, which was um, his uh, exploration of the political nature of man. Now, what Ar uh, Locke argued in two treatises of government, which would be very influential in terms of the political developments of the 18th century, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and others. Uh, in, in two treatises, he argues that human beings, uh, by nature, are kind of in a state of war of all against all. Um, that when we're in a state of nature, it's basically we're all struggling for survival. The biggest and toughest uh, take what they, they want, what they can. And he says, but this, of course, he argues, leads to misery and a lack of any kind of social order if we just live in a state of nature. We can't live like that. Now, John Locke was, uh, was building on the work of an earlier philosopher from about 50 years earlier from... Um, actually more like about 30 years earlier, from the work of Thomas Hobbes, who wrote um, his great uh, political uh, philosophy book known as Leviathan. Now, what, what Hobbes had argued was that human beings, to avoid this state of nature in which we would be like animals fighting over everything and the toughest and biggest taking them all, is we kind of sign on to a social contract, an agreement in which we basically say we're going to give up some of our freedoms. Uh, we're going to give up just taking what we want when we want. Uh, that we're going to do this 
um, in the interest of a civil society, otherwise we're just going to all kill each other and we'll be miserable and awful, um, that um, we give up this some of our freedom to act in the interest of civil society. But what Hobbes argued was that people are so inherently by nature awful that we're just selfish and greedy and terrible. Um, we're so imbued with, to use a the, the Christian idea, so imbued with the original sin that had caused Adam and Eve to fall from the Garden of Eden, um, that you really, in order to avoid that kind of chaos and, and destruction and carnage that would result when human beings live in a total state of nature, that you needed a very powerful state. You needed a very powerful monarch uh, to kind of knock heads together, to make sure that this state of nature was avoided, that you needed this overwhelming authority. The name of his book, Leviathan, also, of course, is the term for a whale. So, in the other words, there's this sort of gigantic creature known as the state uh, that would have to be, that the human beings would have to accept in order to avoid the state of nature in which we'd all kill each other off and take what we wanted and live in a state of, of, of bestial nature. We needed a single, uncontested, God-appointed monarch, or things would immediately get out of control. That's what Hobbes argued. Locke agreed with Hobbes in the sense that we want that human beings had made a sort of decision at some point in their development in order to avoid this kind of chaos and misery um, by kind of signing on to this contract. But where Locke differs from Hobbes and, and moves things forward, I think we would all agree, is that the contract, he says, that people make amongst themselves to establish civil society and, and avoid the state of nature has to be more flexible and responsive than just some overpowering king just ordering everybody what to do. In other words, the government, this, this thing that is needed to keep civil society, to keep us all in order, um, has to be both effective and fair. It has to have, Locke argued, and this is the key ingredient here, it has to have the consent of the governed. The people have to agree to it. They cannot just be ordered around. They cannot just accept the idea that God has appointed this king to rule over them. They must be invested in this contract. They must believe that the state that they have created to maintain civil order is one that they have agreed to. And from this, Locke also came to two very radical and revolutionary ideas. One radical and revolutionary idea he had was that, and this is something that any contract lawyer, any of you pre-law students understand, is that when people sign on to a contract, any kind of contract, the contract, if both sides, are, the contract can be broken, that if one side of the contract, one player, you know, one person in one side of the contractual agreement breaks the contract, then the other side is no longer obliged to stick by that contract. So in other words, if a government, for example, became dictatorial, began to take away basic rights of people, began to violate the contract in, in any number of ways, began to become uh, you know, monstrous and, and, and uh, unfair and, or ineffective or whatever, that the government, it had, in a sense, violated its part of the contract. Its part of the contract was, of course, to assure civil society, assure fair and effective government. If it violated it, then the other side of the contract, which, of course, is the people being governed, can throw out that contract. They, they are no longer bound to it, and they can... Uh, uh, they can force upon the government, and of course the government, you have to have a government, but they can force upon the government a new order of things, or even a new government. If the, gov the, the original government is violating the contract, then the governed do not have to live by the contract. They can sort of tear it up and create a new contract, uh, and even a new partner, a new government uh, to sign on with. So you can see in what Locke is arguing that the potential for people to express their will uh, either through uh, you know either through a representative government to change the, the 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 direction government is going in or more radically to actually overthrow the government through revolution 
And not surprisingly, if one reads the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson, sort of the sentiments of the people, of the Americans who rose up against British rule, that was the basic principle behind their revolution, right? That England, the monarch, parliament, had violated its contract to rule the colonies fairly, and therefore the colonists had every right under Lockean, under the principles of John Locke, to sort of say, well, you're not, you're not following this contract, therefore we don't have to follow this contract, and we can seek to get rid of it and sign on to a new contract, and in the case of the American Revolution, with a contract uh, uh, with a government that is based in the colonies or in, in this new place called America rather than back in England. But even more basic than that, and this ties in with um, his essay on human under, concerning human understanding, what Locke argues is that um, since we, we learn from our experience and our senses um, and then reflecting upon them, come with rational thought to think of what are the principles by which we should live by and organize our society, that through, if we perceive in our senses, we perceive in our experiences that this government is no longer serving our interests, um, that the model that the government has created for justifying its own rule no longer fits in with what we're experiencing, if we're seeing poverty, if we're seeing unfairness, injustice, uh, ineffective government, then they are, then we are allowed to, then, uh, then we are allowed to change it. In other words, if we observe that the government is um, doing things that are not serving our purposes, then those, then that government is acting in an, in an, in a bad way and we can just simply get rid now, around, around the same time Locke is uh, creating his sort of theories of human nature and the kind of government that uh, should rule, uh, the kind of society that we should build, the government that we should place over that society. We go back to France, and this of course underscores my earlier point that it's, even though we call these sort of French and English schools of enlightenment thought, that they kind of blur. Because you, again, we go back to this guy Pierre Bale, who was a, a, a French enlightenment thinker. And while Locke was coming up with his ideas, Bile had produced, um, around the same time, 1697, a historical and critical dictionary. Um, and a couple things we need to take from this dictionary. One is the idea that he wanted to compile everything that is known about a subject. So it was a sort of this comprehensive approach to, under, you know, to understanding the world. And what he was really looking at in, his, in this dictionary, historical dictionary that he created what he created with his historical and critical dictionary, which was its title, um, what he was really looking at is belief and faith. The, the, the looking at belief and how people believed in things and how people had faith in, in things. So he was, he was sort of a religious thing. And with his historical and critical dictionary, he's coming up with a basic Enlightenment idea. And that is, his idea is that if you, prevent, if you present information to people, as much information as possible, um, then you can free them in a sense because by giving them all this information uh, they can take it in and then make wiser, using their rational mind, make wiser decisions uh, about the kind of society they want to organize and about their own behavior. So this is kind of, for him this was a very, you know, this is a very uplifting idea. Um, because the mind is all about observation and reflection, you learn about things and you reflect upon them and you free yourself from the idea that what exists and what always is always must be, that you can change things for the better if presented with enough information about different, from different points of view and different ideas. If you take in all this information, uh, you can use your rational mind to come to better conclusions about how society should be organized and about how human beings should interact with each other. And in his historical and critical dictionary, what Bile was really looking at was he he, exam he, he he tried to read as much as possible and absorb as much as possible about all the different religious and f ideas about faith from all around Europe and for all around the world as best as he could gather that information. Again, this goes back to the idea that as Europe's expansion into the world brings in brings it into contact with other civilizations and other societies with different ideas about God, God's faith, belief and all that sort of thing, Bile takes all this in and presents it in his historical and critical dictionary. And, and really what he's doing with all of this is he's saying that, you know, people are capable of thinking about God and thinking about faith and thinking about belief in all kinds of ways. 
and this is and so you can take a look at what how other people have sort of thought about God and faith and religion and all that kind of thing and come to your own conclusion about what works best, what is the best way to do things. Um, what Bile is sort of coming up with is, is something that we accept in the modern world today. We call it the marketplace of ideas. In other words, present all this information, present all these different ideas about how the human beings in this case should uh, should understand their relationship with the supernatural, with God, with faith, with belief, and from that come to your own conclusions, come to your own ideas about what's the proper uh, role of faith, what is the proper way to believe, what is the proper way, to, uh, what, what is the proper role of religion in society. And even more basically than that, the progress, progress in, in, in how humans live, how they interact with each other, the kinds of societies they, they build, uh, that this kind of progress comes not through force or through you know, military conquest or anything like that, but it comes through intellectual argument and counter-argument and discussion and engagement of ideas. Again, that marketplace of ideas that we have come to so accept in the modern world, in, in, in our modern societies, as the best way to sort of air all these different ideas and come to the best possible solutions to the problems we face in society. And from Bile, we can also we, we, we see sort of the next stage in Enlightenment thought and sort of the, the culmination of the Enlightenment in a group of, at least in the French Enlightenment, a group of thinkers known as the philosophes or philosophers literally in French. And of these, the greatest of these philosophes was a man named Francois-Marie Arouet, better known, of course, by his pen name, Voltaire, who lived from 1694 to 1778. Now we'll get to some of Voltaire's uh, political ideas more when we start talking about the French Revolution next week. But, um, and Voltaire, is one of his greatest achievements was popularizing the ideas of the Enlightenment uh, through his copious writings. Um, he was a gifted writer, he wrote novels, he wrote uh, histories, uh, he was kind of a public intellectual in, in a sense. In other words, he sort of made all of this sort of heady, very difficult to follow Enlightenment thought uh, more accessible to to average uh, uh, thinkers and readers uh, in French society and in European society generally. But he also had many of his own original ideas. And one of the places that he was examining was the concept of tolerance. And you read a brief excerpt from his essay, What is Tolerance? Now, Voltaire, Voltaire was not any great lover of organized religion as he understood it. Um, you know, of course, of course, his quote here, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Um, in other words, uh, you know, he's basically saying that, you know, sort of we've, we've built these religious, these religions um, out of a need to, to have this kind of order in our lives, but they're not actually coming from a higher power. Uh, the concepts, the ideas, and something like the Bible do not come from a higher power. We have created them. We've created them uh, for our own needs, but if they're not serving our needs, then we should dispense with them. And again, to, going back to what we were talking about religion before, one of the reasons why so many Enlightenment thinkers were very skeptical of religion, of course, is that within you know recent history of Europe, um, they had experienced, of course, the, the terrible religious wars of the 17th century. They had seen the destruction and the savagery and, and, and the bloodshedding of those wars. They would also seen uh, actions taken by various monarchs to squelch uh, dissenting religions in the most brutal fashion possible. And so they were kind of responding and reacting to that uh, terrible historical experience. And that was where Voltaire was coming from as well. Now, Voltaire, like many Enlightenment thinkers, was a deist. In other words, he believed that, you know, there had been a creator who had sort of set the universe in motion, but then had let it run on its own. That they, he didn't interfere in daily affairs. He didn't, uh, it or he or whatever you want to call this, this creator, did not involve himself with human affairs. Uh, there was, n he did not intercede on behalf of human beings. There was no way to, there's no real way for human beings to have him intercede. Prayer was not didn't matter. The Bible was just a, a collection of, of sort of myths and stories that people had invented to sort of justify uh, a, a religious-based social order. You know, he believed that, you know, there was a creator, but that's it. We're on our own, as, as deists believe. But what he also argued was that for, for tolerance, 
Uh, in other words, since there really was, you know, he was skeptical of all religions equally. So basically what he's arguing, what he argues is that um, since no religion really has the lock hold on truth, I mean, that, that for, from him they're all false, but since people believe in them and people accept them and, and, and they sort of dominate society, these different religious ideas, in the case of Europe, of course, Catholicism on one side and the various Protestant sects on the other, that the only way for society to exist, the only way for human beings to exist in a peaceful civil society was to be tolerant of others' ide religious ideas, others, uh, 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 other people's points of view on faith and belief in God. Because if we don't do that, we will continue to have endless destruction, endless war. And so what he argues, uh, the idea, which would become a hallmark of Enlightenment thinking, become a hallmark of the revolutions that 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 um, that. Uh, uh, spread across the Atlantic world from France to the United States to Latin America was this idea of separation of church and state. But the state should not take a role in establishing a particular religion because that was only going to create discord, it was only going to create intolerance, it was only going to create infighting in society, and to avoid that the state should simply stay out of it and not sponsor any kind of religion. It should keep religious affairs should remain in the consciences of believers, they should remain in, in, in inside church buildings, they should not be allowed into the public square, they should not be allowed to dictate government, they should not be involved in government, and government should not sponsor one religion or another. So this idea of, of church and state separation is based on the, is is basically to back this idea of religious tolerance. Because basically what he argues is that religion promotes an absolutist way of thinking, right? If you believe in a certain thing, then you believe in it, and you believe you are absolutely right, and the person who doesn't believe in it is absolutely wrong, and if you believe what God says, then there's no room for argument, no room for dissent, no room for intellectual discussion, and he would argue no room for rationality, no room for compromise. In other words, if you're going to have a civil society where you have the consent of the governed and you have all these different ideas and, and that sort of thing, then basically you have to um, allow for all of these ideas to play themselves out, that you can't uh, that, that you can't let religion get into political affairs because religion is about absolutist thinking, one way of believing, one set of values, and politics is all about compromise, all about different people sort of coming together with their different ideas, compromising and figuring out a way to live together, to set up a government that will rule over them in a fair and effective way, and you have to rid that government of that kind of absolutist religious thinking. He also argued, of course, uh, against the idea of the church, the other way around, that the church justifies the state. In other words, he did not. He, he, he argued against this idea of the divine right of kings. In other words, that the king had his position, his, his power, uh, directly from God. Um, because again, that does not allow for human beings to modify their government because they'd be going against God, and therefore it would be absolutely wrong. So. Again, he wanted to keep this this separation of church and state uh, to be uh, uh, that this was the fundamental principle by which society should work. Because otherwise, you can't have civil government, you can't have consent of the government uh, of the governed, because there would be, if if the king is appointed by God and people believe that, then there's no way to to have uh, dissent against the government. There's no way to change that government if it's no longer ruling effectively and fairly. And sort of the, the, the apotheosis, the sort of the culmination of all of this Enlightenment thought was in this production of something called the Encyclopedia or the Encyclopédie in, in, Fran in French. Um, this was a collaborative effort of virtually all Enlightenment thinkers of the day. The term encyclopedia is derived from kind of a somewhat distorted version of the ancient Greek terms for all-around education. And the two French philosophes, the, 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 the two French philosophers who came up with this, Denis Diderot and Jean d'Alembert, uh, had that idea in mind of this sort of all-around education. And kind of building on the ideas of Pierre Bayle and his historic and critical dictionary, they believed that if you gave people an all-around education based on rational thinking, so you had all the great thinkers of the day writing on every possible subject under the sun, both natural science, both the, the, the natural philosophy, the sciences, as well as the social sciences, Sciences as well as philosophy. If you had them, uh, if you gave people an all-round education through this encyclopedia, through this multi-volume encyclopedia, 
um, and 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 all of this sort of all of these articles and all of in the encyclopedia were all based on uh, the thinking, the rational thinking of, of of profound intellectuals who were doing research into subjects. That if you sort of gave people all of this knowledge um, based on observation of the world of these great thinkers, um, who then reflected on that and came up with these ideas. Um, then you could build people's minds, you could build rational informed minds, in other words you could elevate society generally by elevating the minds of those people who are part of that society and then those, then that society and the people within that society could then go on to build institutions whether it be schools, hospitals, laws, governments, whatever they were that reflected rational and foreign thought and make for a better society, a more efficient society and a more fair and just society and one that provided the um, the greatest possible satisfaction, the greatest possible uh, comfort, the greatest possible um, uh, benefits to all. That was the idea behind the encyclopedia. Give all this knowledge to people this based on rational th thinking, based on uh, uh, observation and reflection of these great thinkers. Give it to people and then they could become educated, knowledgeable about things, see all these different ideas, and then use their own rational minds to then create a better society based on the ideas in the encyclopedia. The idea of the encyclopedia is, in fact, very audacious. Um, and again, go back to Kant, sapere aude, we see in the very word aude, the, the, the you know, core word of audacious, of daring, right? Um, so it was an audacious idea, all knowledge available to all people. A kind of internet before the internet, although the internet, of course, as we know, is full of all kinds of crazy, irrational, and totally unedited thought um, that just kind of pours out of it. But, and this, of course, was a much more curated collection. It was much more, you know, it was like a, a, a sort of an Encyclopedia Britannica, which is also, by the way, a product of this era in Britain. But this idea of preventing all sort of knowledge to all people, and therefore they could uh, reflect upon it learn from it, and create a better society. And what Diderot and d'Alembert wanted to uh, do, what they wanted to convey specifically, was in their encyclopedia was support for science and rational thought, support for technical progress, a rational and skeptical approach to all matters that could not be proved rationally, namely faith. Um, remember, they are putting this together in part in reaction to the terrible religious wars of the century before, and a lot of very out-of-date institutions. You know, the, the 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 governments of Europe were based on very old models that didn't seem to be working as the world sort of modernized, as Europe modernized. Now, even as the Enlightenment reached its sort of apotheosis in the in the middle years of the 18th century, that rational thinking could solve all problems there was arising a kind of a different premise, um, uh, though sort of a different school of philosophy. Though they used the skeptical inquiry model created by the Enlightenment philosophers, they said that this, this approach, that, that this, this idea that the rational mind is supreme and can solve all problems, they said it was sort of too, too simplistic, that people, that people don't just act on their rational behavior that they are also they act on their there's, there's also the emotional content of people the people are not pure rational beings sort of like in the argument in in homo in in homo economists economicus um, the idea in sort of modern economic ideas going back to adam smith that people are always acting in a rational way when they make economic decisions and in recent years you've sort of seen the rise of a new sort of school of economic thinking called behavioral economics which argues that you know you have to take into account people's irrational side their 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 um their emotional side when 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 creating economic models and economic systems, um, that basically was the same idea here. That we ha that to really understand human nature and therefore understand it in a way that we can improve upon it and make for a better society, we have to take into account the fact that people are not always rational and that they do have there is an emotional content to what they do and what they think and believe. Um, to examine this, um, we should look at the work of, uh, of two great Scottish uh, thinkers. And it's amazing that Scotland produced such a, 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 
amazing school of enlightenment thought. Um, Scotland was kind of on the edge of the world, very backward uh, uh, region of, of the British Isles until just a few decades before, but it had instituted a mass education uh, program for its people, and sort of out of this mass education program had arisen some of the great Enlightenment thinkers like David Hume and somebody we've encountered before, Adam Smith, when we were discussing capitalism. And David Hume, uh, what he argued, and you can see a couple of quotes here, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. And then the rules of our morality are not the conclusion of our reason. In other words, he argued that um, to get where the Enlightenment wanted to go, if we wanted to use our God-given rational minds, our God-given uh, intellect, our God-given uh, you know, natural given uh, gifts of observation, reflection, observation, sensory input, understand, looking at the world, trying to understand it, and then reflecting on it uh, to create better ideas about how human nature was and the kind of societies we could build from it, that if we want to get to that place, if we want to get to where the Enlightenment wants to go to create a better society, then we have to accept that human beings are not purely rational, that emotion plays a part in everything they do, everything they think, all the institutions that they create, and it's our social being. Um, what he really sort of focused on that that you know we 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 can't just say see see people as you know purely rational trying to uh, you know maximize their benefits acting in cool calm ways what he what he argued was that what human beings are really driven by is something quite irrational that they that since we are social creatures we need the approval of others to bolster our own self confidence our own sense of who we are we need that and so we act upon that in other words we don't act in coolly rational ways detached from the rest of the world and come to conclusions based on pure rational thought we do it on the very unrational basis of you know what will get the approval of our friends and 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 our fellow citizens and all that sort of thing and so we have to take into account that social social nature of us, of wanting to fit in, wanting to get along, wanting to be respected and approved, um, that this is an important part of how we uh, exist, and, it has to, and if we want to make a better society, we have to recognize that fact. The other great thinker who sort of brought this into, into play uh, from the Scottish School of Enlightenment was Adam Smith. Now, we've encountered Adam Smith before when we were talking about his theories of economics. Um, that human that you know the idea of, of freeing things up um, you know not trying to tell people what to do allowing people to each pursue their own selfish interests as they see them um, that they're gonna that in a, the economic sphere they act in a rational way uh, to 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 get as much as possible to put out as little effort as possible to gain as much as they can if we let all of them act in this own greedy way they will benefit society as a whole that there's this sort of invisible hand um, uh, you know, creating good out of all of this greed and selfishness. But even as he was, but shortly before, I should say shortly before he was sort of coming up with these economic theories, he was also sort of examining in some of his other works this idea of the human moral self. And what he we argued is, is that human beings by nature are moral creatures. By nature they want to do good uh, by others. They want to live by laws. They want to act in a moral and righteous way to others. That is the basic human nature. Yes, some people violate it and we need to punish them, but for the most part, people are concerned about others. And he said, if, if that wasn't the case, then our society would have long since degenerated into total chaos and anarchy because the, 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 the state cannot be everywhere ruling every human interaction. And for the most part, when humans interact, they do good by each other. They don't just grab things from others. They don't just take from each other. Um, that we are by natural, what we are by nature moral selves, and we want to do good by others, and we have to kind of take that into our understanding of human nature in order to shape this kind of human societies, the best kind of human society that we want to live on. That we are basically moral creatures, and so we should create a society that allows us, that nurtures that, and allows that to bring that out of us. We're not just simply rational creatures. In other words, we're yes, we're rational. Yes, we want to. Uh, uh, get the most for the least effort, but 
and that is our economic actors, but we also have this moral dimension to us that we don't want to cheat, we don't want to steal from others. Uh, you know, if we do want to make a deal with others, if we do want to maximize our gain, we want to do it in a moral sense, so that this economic interactions are not based on deception or thievery or, or fraud or whatever, but it's based on, you know, each of us uh, offering in an economic, in an economic agreement um, the best we can provide, they offer the best the other person can provide, and, and it maximizes everyone's gain because we are essentially moral creatures and act that way, and therefore we should uh, incorporate that into our thinking about human nature so that we can create a, a better society. So let us now return to our initial theme of what, the, what, what is the Enlightenment, what we started with. Um, it is the idea that human beings, that humanity, can come to understand its own nature, its relationship to each other in terms of society by using the mind, using observation and sensory input, and then applying our rational minds to it, that we can move away from superstition and long-held beliefs if we dare to, sapere aude, and that with this knowledge we can construct better societies that produce more freedom, more happiness, and more productivity for all. But in, but we, in examining the Enlightenment and Enlightenment thinkers, uh, we must remember that most Enlightenment thinkers, despite the radicalness of some of their ideas, were not, they were reformers rather than revolutionaries. Um, yes, get rid of old superstitions, old habits, old practices, um, but not to get rid of them wholesale, not to destroy the institutions that have held society together, uh, family, for example, community. They believe, for example, that faith was important um, for the most part. Uh, as long as they didn't try to impose it on others, as long as they didn't make it too doctrinaire, they believed, you know, that faith was important. People believing in a divine order led to greater happiness and social order. It seemed to work. Um, they believed in the idea of monarchy because having this idea of a king lent stability and order to society. They just didn't think that the king should be an absolute monarch who should just be able to just dictate terms based on the idea that he had been appointed by God. Most believed, in fact, that the best form of government would be that of enlightened despotism. In other words, you have a king, but a king who is enlightened, who who, who followed enlightenment thought. Um, you know, early on, in the very beginning this week, we talked about Immanuel Kant and his praise for Frederick the Great of Prussia, who he saw as one of these kind of enlightened, uh, enlightened monarchs, enlightened despots, in, in a sense that they would that you needed that kind of stability that a monarchy provided. Uh, but the monarch must act on enlightenment principles as we've discussed them. Others uh, held to kind of a slightly different view of things. They, they kind of looked at the British model and they said, all right, you know, we need a king. We need that kind of stability that a king has uh, over society. But that the king, that what we don't need is an enlightened monarch so much as we need institutions um, that can constrain the power of the king. Parliament, for example. Um, that could express the will of the people, um, if only, of course, the better people in society. These parliaments were not democratic in the sense that we know them. And that this idea of a monarchy constrained by representative institutions was the best way forward by society, was the best way to realize the principles of the Enlightenment. But it is ultimately reforming, moving forward in gradual steps, not in revolutionary steps. But as we'll see, of course, uh, it's sometimes hard to control that process, and the Enlightenment would lead to revolutionary steps. Now let's take a look, for example, Locke sort of ca uh, captured this idea uh, uh, the best. Uh, John Locke, that English philosopher we looked at earlier, um, he talked about sort of enlightenment universalism. He talked of liberty, freedom, being uh, as being a, a great thing, but it was not a liberty to, be, to, to absolute license to do whatever you wanted. He argued that people should be as free as possible, but within the confines of protecting life, liberty, and property and that people set up governments to do that, and so the government should have their power limited to that. In other words, the idea that, yes, we give power to governments to protect life, to protect liberty, to protect property, but and, and we should constrain governments to doing just that, to not trying to exercise total control over uh, people. Locke had, had complicated ideas about the idea of, about equality as well. He said that, you know, the idea of absolute equality is wrong. It's evident by the fact that people born to the same advantages, people born to the same, you know, who, who born to the same class of people with the same amount of money, people born with the same educational opportunities, you know, they take, they take advantage of these, these uh, they, take, they, they make use of these advantages in various, to, to differing 
abilities to differing degrees so that it's it's evident it's obvious that people are not uh, equal in their abilities um, but he says that just because um, one person is sort of better than another at certain things that they have greater talents or greater abilities or they use their abilities in a more effective way does not mean that they should have reign over others that they should not be able to control others based on that idea um, that uh, the social order um, you know should not be based strictly on one person determining that I'm greater than another and have right to rule over them by so what Locke was arguing in a sense is that this the, 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 there's this social order of certain people are more effective more uh, talented more able than others um, and this comes from God basically saying that social orders are ordained by God but that it must be constrained by a government that protects the basic rights of all life liberty and property in other words yes there are inequalities in society and some are better than others and there is a social order there's some that rule over others but that rule should be constrained uh, by a government that protects the basic rights of all equality that that except that that protects the basic rights of all life liberty and property and so, in, in a sense, even though the Enlightenment was about reform and gradualism, as we've just discussed, the underlying principle is radical, always to be questioning, always to be imagining a better order of things. And, um, and so we come to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the last of the great Enlightenment th philosophers, and in a way, the first figure that arises in reaction to the Enlightenment. Chronologically, uh, he, when he died in 1778, it was a uh, barely a decade uh, before the outbreak of the French Revolution, which brings the Age of Enlightenment to an end, and I had you read a couple of excerpts of his, one on, in, uh, on inequality. Um, in it, he, he, he outright says it was the development of private property, now going back way back in history, which led to inequality, which led to all of the institutions and ways of life that hamper, that, 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 that limit human freedom, happiness, and wider spread prosperity. That these property, this idea of private property grew up and it now entangles man. Um, that, that this idea of of private property had created this unfair social order, these uh, overbearing governments. It was all um, it was all based on who owned how much private property, and so he questioned this sort of idea that there should be those with so much greater wealth than others. That this sort of undermined um, this undermined a fair and just society. He was also a believer that man in his natural state is superior. Uh, he wrote of what he called the noble savage. He questioned the very idea of rationality, saying it was overrated. Again, sort of reacting to the Enlightenment in a sense. In this sense, uh, and following up on Hume, we talked of man's emotion and pride and envy as drivers of what he did. Rousseau believed that the so-called savages that Europeans were encountering around the world, being in a closer state of nature, um, which is not necessarily true, of course. I mean, they had their own social order, but from Europeans' perspective, they seem to be living closer to nature. We're better off than the so-called civilized people of Europe. That people, that the, the civilized people, have lost have lost a lot in, in their quest for civilization. He felt that mankind would do well to try and return to a state of nature as best he could, that our natural instincts were best, and that civilization and private property had corrupted them. Rousseau also began to lay out the ideas of popular sovereignty in his, again, the idea that the people are the ultimate source of all power in society. In his claim, in, in his On the Claims of Community, an essay he wrote, he puts forth the idea of the social contract that we talked about earlier. People bake amongst themselves to set up a state, to set up a government that will maintain civil order. Um, first he notes in another part that man is born free but he is everywhere in chains, meaning that man in a state of nature is free but civilization has constrained him. Rousseau says that this is necessary, reflecting Locke, who he was much enamored with, Locke's idea of course that you know you needed to have certain constraints on human liberty otherwise you would have total chaos. Um, we need a social order restraint. Um, he said that <clears throat> He said that liberty has to be married with certain constraints, or the powerful would trample over the weak, and we need a social order to constrain that. But, he argues, that social order must also rest on the people's will. That for the social compact of people, social contract of people agreeing to go along with the laws 
that constrain them, right? We create these laws that tell us, you know, we can do certain things, can't do other things. Those laws must come from a social order and a government that is agreed upon by the people themselves. And from that, as we'll see next week, we get the revolutionary idea that the ultimate power, that sovereignty comes not from a monarch, not from a divinely sanctioned king, from God, but from the people themselves. And, and next time we will look at how all of this thinking led to action, specifically in the French Revolution, that's what we'll look at next week, but also the American Revolution and the Latin American Revolutions and the Haitian Revolution in the week that follows. Um, that like everything else, uh, mankind, when mankind puts its mind to something to make changes, it can do amazing things, but also commit horrible excesses that we'll see particularly in the French Revolution. But before we conclude on the Enlightenment, we need to look at uh, a whole other uh, element of it, and that is uh, the work of Mary Wollstonecraft, which I also had you read. Um, now, Wollstonecraft, uh, who is very much influenced by the principles of the French Revolution, which we'll lay, talk about uh, next week, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, you know, these sort of basic Enlightenment ideas uh, infused into a political document. Um, and, you know, most Enlightenment thinkers uh, made sort of, a, a, a exempted a, a big portion of humanity uh, from their conclusions about human nature, and that, of course, was women. Uh, for the Enlightenment, with a notable few exceptions, really had a blind spot. Uh, so let us take a look at that idea. We talked about this a little bit before. Uh, on, on Monday, that women, the idea that Enlightenment thinkers, you know, who, who so much uh, honored the idea of rational thought, the, the argument was that women are not rational, um, that it is in their nature not to be that way, that they, while they deserve all of the benefits of a, uh, a proper social order, that really they should not have a major role in it because they're not capable of taking the reins of government. They're not capable of acting in purely rational ways because it's just not in their nature. That was sort of the conclusion that, you know, that was sort of the, 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 the sort of the great blind spot that many Enlightenment thinkers um, had. And of course, most of the, and of course, most of these Enlightenment thinkers were. But what Wollstonecraft offered in her uh, Vindication of the Rights of Women uh, which I had to read an excerpt from, written in 1792, a few years after the French Revolution had began. Um, she argues, we talked about before, that women, that women's nature is not, just like man's nature, is not inherently irrational, but that it is shaped by their education. And again, going back to, to Kant's idea um, that, um, you know, one has to um, sort of grow out of that immaturity that they accept. In other words, Wollstonecraft sort of applies the idea of Kant, who was a contemporary of hers, who said, you know, mankind sort of wants to live in immaturity because it's it's too scary and too and and too much work to sort of go beyond the confines of what is accepted thought to to break out of that. And she applied it to to women. She said, women are ruled by a soft form of slavery their full potential undermined by turning them into, the turning them and fo having them focus on the frivolous things in life. Um, and this sort of ties in with Locke's idea, that, that Locke's idea is that we are built from the various experiences and sensory input that we get in life, that, they, that that is what creates who we are, that's what creates how we think and how we act. Um, and so if women are only exposed to frivolous things like flat fashion and makeup and, and how to get a man and all this kind of thing that even still exists in our society, that they are going to be, that it is going to shape who their minds are, as Locke said. That is, we are the products of, we are, we're born a blank slate. We're not, women are not born irrational. They're, they're born with a blank slate just like men are, and they are shaped by their experiences. They're shaped by their education. They're shaped by what, they ex what, what happens to them in life. And because of that, um, because they are always steered in this frivolous and, and, thing to, to, to act in, in this kind of way and to focus on these kinds of things, um, that that's what's limiting them. That, that, that She says that, Walter argues that in regards to the mind, women may very well be the equals of men. And she said the main thing holding women back is that men were not willing to accept that. It was too scary for them. In a sense, she's sort of playing off Kant and saying, you know, they're, the, 
men are, are wedded to the idea that women are irrational and are incapable, are, are not equal to men, that they are not capable of participating in the shaping of their own society because they're not capable of irrational thought, of, excuse me, of rational thought. Therefore, that is, you know, it's a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and that men are too scared to let go of that idea. It's their immaturity that kind of keeps women in their particular immaturity and that for the Enlightenment to be fully realized, according to Walt, Wollstonecraft, all must be included in it, women and men alike. Um, another aspect that was sort of ignored by the uh, French, uh, by the, the sort of Enlightenment thinkers was, uh, and something we'll see acting out in the French Revolution and the American Revolution, is the idea of can non-whites, non-Europeans also be included in this sort of Enlightenment society? Are they capable of it? And as we'll see, um, the it would be a big controversy within uh, the French Revolution and the American Revolutions, for example, to apply these Enlightenment principles of consent of the governed and the idea of rational thought, all people being equal uh, based on that idea, uh, will be tested uh, when it comes to how Europe interacts with non-white peoples around the world. So thank you for listening, and now please um, take the quiz that comes at the end of this um, lecture based on what you have just uh, heard and watched and we will uh, meet again on Monday um, February 17th thanks for listening bye bye